action. Just got a note from Jim Martin. He read a review of my book, and he, he, he read my book, too. He's read both of my books. See, just, this, is, this is not a distraction. This is sort of synchronous. I did create relationships with artists back then. That, and the reason I mention this now is because some of them survived through the last 15 years where I didn't have a platform to canonize artists and make it great. Jim Martin was the original guitarist and found one of the founders of Faith No More from El Sobrante. Uh, pig farmer. Or yeah. Well, he's from Northern California. He grew up with that field. He didn't grow up with it because that field's from down. But he's from that uh, from that garage scene up there where Les Claypool came from in Exodus. And anyway, Jim Martin is one of the truest. I mean, if there's a Lester Bangs music type musician, it's him. And he, he's connected with my writing with these last couple of these books that I wrote because uh, he doesn't have any agenda. He, they didn't invite him to the reunion when they put Faith No More back on the road. And I've stayed in touch with him. We, we reconnected when Metallica was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in uh, 2008. And I was invited by the band. And that was a special occasion. That's also something that... I mean, Meta I, I, I consider my relationship with Metallica is, 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 is precious. You don't talk to him or see him. Well, I saw years. that YouTube clip that I think he posted with you and Mars after he'd done the Napster press thing. And Not a lot of people have seen that. Yeah, that was one of, the, I think, the few things that Well, I'll tell you the story behind that clip. Uh, I was the editor-in-chief of KNAC.com in 2000, and... Um, Rob Jones was the, he founded it, he took, he, he got the old legendary call letters from KNC FM, Long Beach 95.5, and he, he built, built it on the web, and almost overnight, traffic started to build because he was doing the first 24-7 streaming hard rock radio station on the web. So it got to the point where they wanted some non-broadcast content, and they found me. And I talk about this in the new book, because it came right as my six-month gig at Interscope was ending, where I was like, I went in, and I hadn't worked in almost a year and a half after the Arista job. But that door closed, and here I all of a sudden am back, kind of like being an online rip guy again. So somewhere in some time at the moment in the spring of 2000, this news story breaks about Napster. And I'm surrounded by all these tech guys. I'm not a tech guy. I still can't do anything but really check my email and occasionally post things on Facebook. But I'm surrounded by all these guys, and they're telling me, like, this is the biggest story. So Rob says, do you think you can... He goes, at the core of this this uh, scandal, and it really was a scandal, is Lars Ulrich and Metallica in effect preparing to sue their fans for downloading music. This is, this is, this is a band that, like the Grateful Dead before them, allowed people to tape their shows and pass them around. So it was, in, it was a little inconsistent with the ethos of what Metallica was. But they're also brilliant businessmen, and the, 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 the business mind of Metallica, I mean, the genius of Metallica is Lars Ulrich and Cliff Bernstein, and Peter Mensch, their managers. That's like, they're the trinity. That's why they've made very few missteps. But even the missteps become successful works of art, like Some Kind of Monster and the, the S&M, the, concert. Things that you wouldn't think they do. Anyway, I, I digress. So Rob says, do you think you can get a hold of Lars? He's going to to the Menlo Park Courthouse in San Francisco to file petitions against Napster users. He goes, this is the biggest story. He goes, if you can get an exclusive interview with them, it would blow up our traffic. I said, well, let me try. And I didn't preface it I didn't do anything. I just said to Rob, let's go up there with the camera without any prep, you know, 
schedule, let's just go up and be at the courthouse when Lars drops off the petitions. And I'll see him when he comes out. And, uh, and I'll ask him. But I don't want to do anything prior. He goes, let's do it, brother. Because, you know, Rob was into anything that would be in any way groundbreaking in this medium that we were nurturing. Streaming content. So, <laughs> there's the press conference. There's an MTV camera there. There's his lawyers, King Perditch, you know, Peter Paterno, one of my oldest, really true old, oldest friends, one of the only lawyers that I still consider a friend in the music business. And there... They're on the podium, and Lars is giving some speech about, you know, protecting musicians, and and they do their thing, and there's all this hustle and bustle, and I'm standing with Rob, and I, and I'm like, the thing is over, and it's all, and I go, and I like wave, and I catch his eye, he goes like that. I said, Rob, let's go, let's just wait over here. So we wait. A few minutes later get into a van, and Lars is sitting in the van with me and Rob, and I go, dude, I think you should talk to your core and explain to them what you're doing. And we are what everybody's watching now. If I was Rip Magazine now, this is what I would be doing. And you would talk to me if I was Rip Magazine, because you always did. And let's just do an interview. So he says, okay, wait a minute. And he calls up Cliff Bernstein, and he gets Cliff on the phone. This Lon wants to do an interview, KNAC.com. Just me and him. He says, you know, I should talk to the core. And Cliff gets on the phone with me. I said, I'm not, you know me. Yep, we have history. I just want to talk to him about what he's doing, and we'll put it up on the, on the web. So they said, okay. So we drove about 10 minutes away from courthouse in the van together and the lawyers are following us in a car and we stop at a park and we get out of the car rob's just got a little camera this is all we it was just me and him and then and, and lars and the lawyers and we find a bench we sit on the bench and it's just like it was just like it was 10 years before with me and him during the black record or just talking about you know two two old friends and I and you, you can look at the interview your fans need to understand what you know what, what are you doing what's happening and I'm not confrontational I've never been confrontational especially with people I have history with I just wanted to hear his take so he could tell it we got so much traffic we got picked up by the Wall Street Journal they talked about us and I came back by by that night it was up the next day it was like wow we just pulled the coup and it was it was cool. Bye, guys. Bye, darling. And it was and it was cool. So that's the inside. I don't think I've ever told that story about how that came together, but that's it. Yeah, it was a cool clip to see on yeah. YouTube. Yeah. I didn't know about the backstory. Yeah. That at all. Um, I've heard you uh, described as the Zelig of rock, okay. and I had seen a YouTube clip of you and Ricky Rackman. I think it was like in the, the early days of Rip. And it was around the time that Ricky Rackman had pretty much done his interview with the client of the Western Civilization. You were like kind of like very business attire. Well, that was at the no, that was at the very first uh, Rip Magazine Cat House party, the anniversary party. So we were a year old, and Cat House was was celebrating the anniversary. So I met Ricky. I interviewed Ricky for Chic Magazine. I, you ask him who's the first person to ever write a piece about you in the beginning of your career in Los Angeles, and he'll tell you, in a national magazine, it, it was me. I wrote about him being a club entrepreneur and asked him about, you know, when Nikki Six OD'd in his club and stuff. Because he had a buzz, and he also had something that I had. He had the early Guns N' Roses familial connection. We were, like, all part of that trusted group. He, because he had the cool club, and me, because I had the cool magazine. So we threw a party together, and yeah, I looked kind of, that's the party where Sly Stone was really, came, was really wasted, and a couple of the Bengals showed up, and Lemmy, of course, was there. That was at the cat house, so there's not a real big story about that, but it began a run, because we, we threw 
I threw seven parties I, I, in a row, I, 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 and Rick, they became iconic. Rick came out like right before Guns N' Roses really hit, and then they, Guns N' Roses really became the Rick became the home of that. Yeah, we yeah we definitely. We Do had you the think first there was articles. some sort of synchronicity going of on? Of course there was. Yeah, it was a kind of a planetary alignment. I couldn't have asked for another band to be brought in from down from the heavens and landed and to have access to that act. We we ran the first articles and then I hired Dell James. Gave him a job because I knew he was close with Axel and the group and, and Izzy. So I gave Dell a job. He was a he was a, a fledgling writer from from New York, from Brooklyn. And he he was tight with the guys. And he, you know, he, he wrote fiction, but he he was just, there's so much mistrust all the way through with the Guns N' Roses camp. They loathed the media from day one. Well, getting the ring is a perfect example. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not mentioned in that song. You want to hear the get, want to hear the get in the ring story? Sure. Okay. So I'm at, I'm at Shoreline Amphitheater, Guns N' Roses, Skid Row. Uh, the Use Your Illusion records are being tracked. It was the it was the one and only time I met Bill Graham because he ran by me uh, because uh, because Sebastian was late going on stage and he goes, "Who the fuck does that kid think he is, Axl Rose? I'll break his fucking neck." It's hilarious. And then an hour later, he was he, he was walking by. He goes, "Everything's cool. I'm gonna go chase some pussy." Said something like that. Anyway, um, after that performance. Um, in the backstage area, the Shoreline Amphitheater has this kind of like redwood area, this deck, and it's where people kind of hang. It's, it, you had to have a lamb in it to get back there, which of course I did in those days. It had to everybody who got backstage. Yeah, I had, to, I, had to, I, had to give a, I had to get a Hummer to get backstage. Um, so uh, there's like maybe three or four people in Dell's back there, and Axel comes out of the dressing room, and he goes, I want to play you something. I said, okay. He goes, stay here. I go, okay. So he comes out, he brings out a CD, and there's, these, there's a stereo set up on the patio, and there's these two big speakers. So he plays this. And I hear the opening riffs. And it, I, I'm hearing Get in the Ring. And I'm listening to the verses. And Axel's sitting there with like this shitty grin on his face. And I and I go, it's over. And, 